Last class, some of the things we learned last time. What was the last time that you remember from Monday? Control the tuning. Yeah. So we learned how to read those tables, how to read those graphs. Anything else we learned? No one can read the notes from Monday yet? Back quick. As I've said a few times, this is a course that you should not fall behind even a single class because it's so cumulative. You don't want to miss that a crucial layer of understanding and then you build on it in the next class and you don't have it in place. I always recap to make sure you catch up, but anything else you would do? So we started off last time, I remember, by learning what are the three requirements of a good control system. The first requirement is, of course, low error. The second requirement is offset-free behavior. So in other words, our error goes to zero after a while. And the third requirement is we have a manipulated variable that behaves relatively smoothly. Okay? We cannot change our valves rapidly going from, say, 50% open to 100% open in zero seconds. That doesn't work, right? So we, we don't do that to our processes. We don't put a shock into our system. So the manipulated variable behavior must be smooth. And what Dr. Marlin did in his textbook is he derived control of tuning that achieves those goals for us. It gets low error, offset free behavior, the offset key behavior comes for free because we've got a PI control. The I and the PI control is what guarantees us offset key behavior. But the first requirement is a low error, and that's what the control and tuning does for us. And the third requirement is smooth manipulated variable behavior. That's another, another facet of the control and tuning. So our goal then was last time was selecting the values of KC. T I and T B to meet our goals. So whenever you use that table, you must make sure that your goals in tuning the control loop match with that. Right? So those are very good goals to have low error and to have smooth manipulated variable behavior. They work in almost all systems in chemical engineering. But should you happen to become a control engineer one day or specialize in this area, there will be occasions where these are not your goals, and so you have to look at other control issues. But for the vast majority of systems, these goals are suitable. So let's take a look at what we did as well, just as a recap. This diagram is going to become something that you're going to become very tired of soon, but we'll start with it again. Our set point coming in. And we're going to take that set point and compare it to my control variable and get feedback in a minute. That error then, that's really our crucial entity. That's the, that's the term if we want a small error and we want it to go to zero after a long period of time. That's what we're going to do with this controller that we simply call GC. And that controller is going to help get a manipulated variable input into my process. So that's typically a vowel that don't need to close this. So the manipulated variable in most cases is a vowel that we change its position. Then I meet reality. So the GP over here, this is simply represents reality. So our process isn't a transfer function, but we're going to represent our process with one. And that output then we call our control variable. But we learned last time there's one other term that we add to it, and that's our disturbance. So we've learned and spoken about disturbances a few times, we will again today. That disturbance comes into this system and we represent our disturbance with another block diagram and a D. So that's a, an input into my disturbance model, so GD of 
on this is a model of my disturbance and how it impacts the process. So those two sum up together and we get our control variable CV and that's what we feed back all the way to the beginning of the day. Now, the control and tuning that you can see on the table in front of you, that has an important assumption. So the CF current tuning rules, they're built up on the fact that G P of S is G P of S. So that the way our disturbance affects our control variable, so this disturbance coming in will impact my control variable. The dynamics of that disturbance are no different to the dynamics of the manipulated variable. Okay, that's true for many systems. That's a reasonable assumption as well. We gave the example of the temperature in this room last class. Remember, I said the temperature in this room, if that's my control variable over here, T is the temperature in the room. It's affected by the velocity, the amount of air coming in through this duct over here. There's several ducts in the room. If you put it in hot air in the room, that effect of the flow rate of that hot air is going to affect temperature. The temperature is also going to be affected by the amount of heat transfer through this wall and these windows to outside. So we're losing heat or we're gaining heat in the summer. And the effect of that on our room is going to operate in the same way. The dynamics of that in this are going to affect our process in the same way. So those are good really assumptions to, to use. And those modern tuning rules also assume that this transfer function has the form of a first order plus dead time. So we covered that last time we said we're going to use a gain of k, time delay of theta units, the time constant of tau s plus 1. And we call this the first order plus time delay. So you sometimes see F O T D first order of F O P T D. And that's a I said last time is a really good model for a process, many realistic systems can be represented by that. Okay, and I'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a few classes from now. I will show you that even very complex second order, third order processes um, can be represented by this model quite adequately. So it's a good representation of reality. The next question that comes up is, remember when we use these rules, there's two columns of graphs. The column on the left hand side is used for disturbance model tuning, and the model on the, on the graphs on the right is for disturbance So there was some question last class about should we use the graphs on the left or should we use the graphs on the right? This will be the very Monday tutorial to face the same question as well. And that's the goal of today's class is to understand a little bit between those two distinctions. So the question that you should have in mind is, why is there a difference between control and tuning for disturbances and control and tuning for second changes? So why is there a difference between control and tuning for disturbances versus set point changes. It's an important question to understand because you have to recognize the following aspect. In a process, this block over here, GC of S, So one day your, your job as a control engineer will be to go set the settings of KC, TI, 
and TV. You go to the computer, you do some testing, you set those values in case of CI and TV, and you walk away. And this control system will keep operating for the next two, three years. Okay. But some days that process is going to have disturbances, and other days that process is going to have set point changes. You don't go change the control and tuning before you make a set point change. You don't go change the controller tuning before a disturbance comes that impacts your process. You've got to pick controller tuning that works well for both situations. Or you have to know in advance which situation your process is the most likely to encounter and tune for those settings. So as you'll see in the rules on the sheet in front of you, if you look and you turn your page a little bit to the side, you'll see a box over there. And step number four says, select the appropriate correlation for disturbances or set points. Use the disturbances if you're not sure. In other words, you use the left-hand side column. In other words, assume that under no better knowledge that you're tuning for disturbances. Now, why does it even matter? Well, it matters, and you're going to prove it yourself, because it matters that the effect of a disturbance on your control variable over here is very different to the effect of a set point change. So when you make a set point change compared to when you make a disturbance, you will see a different response in the process. How do we prove that? Well, this one is easy to prove. You've seen before that if you change the control variable, sorry, if you change the set points, that's your input, your output is the control variable, we can derive a transfer function that represents that entire input output relationship. In other words, I'm asking what is the effect here on the CV, on the output, if I make a change in the set point? And in a previous tutorial and in class, we worked through the block diagram, we worked backwards through the feedback loop and come back around, and we've shown that this ratio of the output, the control variable to the input, the set point, is equal to gc of s times gp of s divided by plus gc of s. So we've proved that before in class. Take two, three minutes now and prove to yourself. In other words, show me that CV of S for an input in a disturbance S is equal to GV of S over 1 plus GC of S. You're going to prove the second one now. Take two, three minutes and prove that to me. And this is the key reason why we have two different types of controller tuning. This transfer function here on the left is different from the one on the right. So we need to adjust our process to those two.
Okay, so we've got these two different responses depending on whether we're making a set point change or a disturbance change. So let's take a look at why that second one is what it is. This is something that you are quite comfortable with now with block diagram algebra. So recognize that the control variable out here, CB, is equal to the sum of two parts. It's equal to GE of S times the disturbance S at D of S plus it's equal to GP of S times GC of S times that error E. But that error E of S is equal to the set point change minus the control variable. And if we're interested in finding the response on CV when I make a change in D, well, I'm only interested in change in seeing what the effect on the process is if I'm making a change in D. So let SP of S equal zero. In other words, we're not making a change when these are deviation variables. Set SP equal to zero. This derivation and this analysis, I'm only interested in finding uh, what's going to happen if I'm changing D on the output? So if I want to make sure that I identify what D is the effect is on the output, I should let this other input, S key, go to zero, because I don't want this to interfere in my understanding. Okay, so E of S then is simply the negative of C D of S. So now I can write CB of S and have one, bring this term over to the right hand side, on the left hand side, one minus CB of S, GC of S, and then E of S I can sum in there to minus CB of S. that and pull out the CV of S, I can show that's equal to 1 plus GP GC. I'm going to drop this, the brackets S and that's going to be the norm in the future. Is equal to GD times D. And then if we simplify that further, we get CV of S divided by D is equal to GD in the numerator divided by 1 plus GC okay, So this sort of manipulation on a block diagram is something that's going, should be very, very comfortable for you by now. Or you should practice enough so that you understand what's going on. So the key result that you take from this is the fact that the output on my control variable is going to be very different depending if I'm considering set point changes versus considering disturbances. And for that reason, we're going to have different control achievement because of those two types of differences. But I'm going to show you coming up that really the difference is minimal in most situations. So, to this example that we had, had previously. With the tank and the hot water and the cold water coming in. So if we look back at that tank, 
and then we had the flow of cold water coming in, and we had the flow of hot water coming in. Remember, we were adjusting that to the We're mixing this material up, measuring the temperature T on the output, and that temperature T was then our input into our controller. That controller has as the input the set on change. So that's where you want the temperature to be. The controller accepts the current value of temperature, calculates an input, and tells the flow of the hot water valve to open and close, for example. So we're comfortable with that. And we have a disturbance. The disturbance in my process is this flow of cold water. So if we're looking at this sort of notation that I have over there on the very right hand side, CV over S over SP over S, that would be, in this example, you'd be considering the effect of temperature, that's my control variable, this over here is my control variable, so temperature <coughs> over the set point of S. That's going to be my set point response. If I was considering the disturbance response, that is the effect on temperature when I make a change in the flow of the cold water, Fc or S. And we call that my disturbance response. back to this question, how do you know, do you use the left hand side figures or the right hand side figures? And the answer is it depends on the process, or it depends on the system you're working with. Okay? So do I use set point changes? Or disturbance changes? question. Well, in this example, if your goal with the process is to regularly change the set point from some temperature to a different temperature that's higher, and then maybe a few hours later you want to change to a lower temperature, then a few minutes later you go back up to another temperature. So in other words, you're regularly changing set points. So you use this if you are regularly changing set points. Okay, and there, there are a good number of processes where that is their goal, is they're continually moving to different levels of set points. So a refinery, for example, might be making one type of material one grade of jet fuel and then a few hours later they need to switch to making a different grade of jet fuel. Different set points then come and get downloaded to the control systems and the entire plant reshifts and moves to a new operating point. So you want everything to quickly adjust back to a new operating point as fast as possible so your transition time is short because anything that's happening in the transition, you can't sell that product. You, it's uncertain quality. So. You want that set point change to happen rapidly. If you look at the process and you say, well, you know what? I actually want temperature to be constant most of the time, but I have to recognize that this flow of cold water comes from some upstream process, and it's going to some days be low, some days high. It's going to vary quite a bit. 
then your process is mostly responding to disturbances. Then you'll use the disturbance chains. So if you are mostly responding to disturbances, So for example, this temperature really needs to be constant most of the time in order to ensure a good quality product. So your CV should be close to SP and you're not going to go around changing that set point up and down all the time. Set point is pretty well constant, it's fixed, decided by engineers previously. The goal of this control system primarily is to eliminate disturbances. So the goal here is to eliminate remove disturbances. And then, this is why Dr. Mahan says in the tuning rules that if you're unsure, use that as your objection. Because this is what most control loops do. Day in and day out, they sit there and they eliminate disturbances. They're not primarily used for set point changes. So that's good advice to follow. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at an example, and this is the same example from the Monday's tutorial, and if you've got the handout there in front of you, you're going to calculate quickly the controller tuning for both set point changes and for disturbance changes. We're going to compare them, we're going to simulate them during class and see how different they actually are. So, here's your process. You can get started so long with the calculation for both types of tuning. Considering the case where the process is the same as the disturbance, and we're going to use the example of a gain of minus 4. So this is <coughs> for some of you, we've got a negative gain this time, e to the minus 5s <coughs> divided by the time constant of 3. So uh, here, get a start on that, and calculate the control region. KCTIFTD for both set point and disturbances. If anyone needs a handout of the tuning rules, uh, please raise your hand. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
values of the expectations <laughs> can keep for disturbance? <coughs> C K P equals 0.6. Yeah. Okay. 0.56 over here. 0.56, 0.58. Sorry. 0.11, 0.12. Okay, so any values sort of in that range will work. So Read off the graph and then read across on the horizontal from the horizontal axis. You're at 0 0.62558 for theta over theta plus tau. 0 0.625. So read up and across against the line. Okay, so this will get you controller tuning. Then okay, let's just put it over here. KC minus 0 0.15. Ti will be a value of 4.65 approximately. And Td, you get a value of about 0 0.96. Anyone got the values for set point shooting? 0 0.5. Okay, so 0 0.5, 0 0.52 is what I got. But 0.5 is okay. Anything that's in the range here of about 0.5. Any values for TI? 0 0.56. Okay, so 0 0.56, I got 0 0.58. Okay, yeah, so that's the same value. And TD, I got the value of, on the horizontal axis, 0 0.13. So if I convert that then over to KC, TI, and TD, I got a KC of zero, negative 0 0.13. For TI, I got exactly the same value, 4.65. And for TD, I got 1.04. Okay, so for the people on that side of the class that may not be able to see what's written over here, the set point tuning values are pretty much identical to the disturbance tuning values. Okay. You're not even going to visually notice a difference if you simulate these two settings side by side. So there's no point in showing you that there's a difference. They're pretty much identical tuning values. Now, if you take a look at this graph here, one thing you'll notice is a rule of thumb that you can use for your career going forward is that for a first order plus dead time system, the reasonable value of Ti to use is about 0.6. It will work in, in many situations quite well. Ti is probably one of the most important tuning rules that you have because that's going to guarantee your offset could be negative. So using a value of around about 0.6 for most processes, this graph shows you you always need a Ti. Ti is never zero. You always need some value of Ti the reasonable value is 0.6. This bottom set of curves show you that T can be roughly zero for small dead times, but for larger dead times, you should have that built-in predictive, anticipatory part of the PID controller. And so as you get to longer dead times, longer faders, you move more to the right of the graph, that's where the derivative mode is useful. So let's take a look now at simulating that and I'm going to show you is what control engineers do in practice. So everything we've learned actually in the past three, four, in the three weeks in this course is probably the most important material um, that you will take away. <coughs> so when control engineers go about tuning a control loop in a company, they first get, uh, I just erased it here, but they get the transfer function for the process. So that's the first step that they do. So they figure out what that transfer function is. Then they go to Simulink or a similar piece of software and they simulate 
control the tunings after they look them up on the table. So let's take a look at that over here, interactively. So there's my process, GP, with a time delay. And there's my step disturbance, GD. So actually, let me put it back here again. GP of S. GD of S. Minus 4 to the minus 5 S with a tau of 3. Now, take a look at what I've done here. Notice I've, I've removed the manipulated variable input into the process. So over here, I've taken away the input. So all that I'm going to do when I simulate this is I'm going to do, make a step response over here. I'm going to see the effect in the control variable. So I'm making a step at time 40 of unit 1. And what that has on the control variable is it shows that at time 40, the step occurs but I have to wait a certain units of delay before I see that drop down. Okay, I've got five units of time delay. And even though the step occurs at time 40, it's not until time 45 that we start to drop. And we drop because the gain here is negative. Okay? Remember, here's D is a step input. So I'm stepping, making a positive step of unit one up into a process that has a gain of minus 4 over 3s plus 1. And then there's a time delay, e to the minus 5s, and then that goes, goes up to the control variable. So if I make a positive change, I'm going to see a drop on the output. So that's totally expected. And we drop a total of 4 degrees. So I started at 0, and then in deviation form, I dropped by 4 degrees. Now the goal of the controller is to counteract that disturbance, right? So that's the whole purpose of disturbance, disturbances and control loops, is that the controller should say, well, hang on, I see that you're dropping away from set points. Set point is 0. And the controller is going to say, there's this error now, and it's going to try and bring it back up to 0. Because think of what the, what's happening here. If set point is zero, so here I'll let me just temporarily delete this for you. So it's gone. I'm not. I'm putting zero in there. There's nothing coming in. In other words, this control system's goal is to keep the control variable at zero, and that's the only thing it should be doing. So the moment this disturbance impacts the process, this feedback loop is going to kick in and try to undo that disturbance. Okay, so when we close the loop here now, let's, let's close the loop. Put that manipulated variable into the process. And there I've used the controller tuning we've just calculated. AC is minus 0.15. There's my tau i, 4.65. And there's my TD, which is 0.96. So I'll post this simulation on the, on the website for you. You can try it out yourself. Now if we run that controller, we take a look at our control variable, it does exactly that. It sees the disturbance coming in, and then it tries to bring it back up to zero. And what is the manipulated variable doing? Well, the manipulated variable is got the following action. So it's at zero initially, then the manipulated variable drops to minus one to counteract that change in the system. So it's doing exactly what we expect. And notice how smooth that manipulated variable is. It's a simple drop down to zero, from zero to minus one, but no overshoot. So it's not very aggressive, and it's getting rid of that disturbance for us. So everyone, understand what's going on there. Yeah? So KC, TI, TD, these are the controller tuning that we read from Dr. Marlin's textbook. Now you might think, well, let me, let me quantify what's happening here. Remember we said Dr. Marlin found his tuning, controller tuning, so that you have minimum absolute error. So let's recall what that is. I, AE was the minimum error, and that's the integral from 0 to infinity of the absolute value of the set point minus 
minus the control variable. <coughs> and another way you can write that is the integral from 0 to infinity of the integral of the error. So integral of absolute error is what it's doing. So let's take a look. Well, there's my error. Let's visualize what the error is doing. The error is that signal over there. I start at zero, I've got zero error. The controller starts to see this error building up and then brings the error back down to zero. So it does exactly what we want from a good control system. At the finishing time, we've got no error. And this area under the curve is IA. Well, can we calculate IA? Yeah, we can. So we look at some tools here that we can calculate that for us. There's an absolute value. We need an absolute value of the error. And we need the integral of the error. So let's bring this in over here. We're going to take the error, calculate the absolute value. Then we need to integrate the error. Well, the integral, we just take an integrator. Here's an integrator. We show that the Laplace transform of an integral is 1 over s. And then we want to see what that integral is as a, as a number on the display. We can go add a block there. It's called, oops, it's a sink. So under the sinks, you can go and pull in one of these displays. So it will display a number. <coughs> So now when we simulate that, we calculate the integral of the absolute error is 31. So IAE for this controller is 31. Now, you might decide, well, let me see what happens if I change KC and TI. Is my IAE going to go higher or lower? Can I get an improvement in that? So whenever you do this, Good control engineers keep track of what they're doing, and they do it as follows. You can set up a small table for yourself and keep track of your settings that you currently use. So KC, TI, TE, and IAE. So our KC right now is minus 0.15, TI was 4.65, and TE was 0.96 and we've got an integral absolute error of 31. So this is exactly what control engineers do when they tune your control. They say, these are the values, the three values I get from the textbook. Let me see what happens if I change it. So what's going to happen if KC goes higher? What should happen? We've learned about this before. But Proportional part of the PID controller. If we increase that P, that KC value, more aggressive control. So we take more aggressive action with the hope that we see smaller error. Okay, so let's take a look and put that at minus 0.2. So KC, let's put it negative 0.2. We're going to leave TI and TV where they are. And there's a KC over here as well, so put that in. If we integrate that now, we get 25.96. So 26 is my IA. So higher KC seems to get us an improved objective function, so lower integral error. So why stop there? Let's go a little bit further. So let's try minus 0.3. We run that simulation now. What's happening? Okay, so minus 0.3. Almost TI 4.65, 0 0.96. Now I'm getting a value of 36. So you've taken too aggressive action. So you've actually created more error for yourself. Let's take a look at that error signal. If I look at error over there, 
That's what it looks like. So by error now, previously recall, let's go back to the, the, the well, if we went back to the original setting, that error would be we went up and then we went down back to zero. So this time we're seeing we've overshot and we're getting oscillation. So that oscillation now, if you integrate the area under that curve, you actually get a, a larger integral. Here's a really neat way you can see what the IAE objective function is doing. If I take the signal over here, and we take the absolute value of it, and I'll show you what the absolute value signal looks like. It does exactly what we expect. Okay. So the absolute value of the error signal simply takes the integral, that error signal takes the absolute value and we're calculating the total area under all those balances. So if I use a less aggressive controller, I'll get less of those balances occur. So I, and basically what I've done here and shown you in the past few simulations is what we call fine tuning. I'm fine tuning the controller and now when I've gone back to back to this case over here with negative 0.2, I've got less aggressive control. And a better and lower error. So the point of this is start with the controller tuning from the large tables and then fine tune from there for this case. And next class we'll take that further and show you what happens when you go unstable. Uh,